Today I'd like to share an idea with you. I would like to, um, it's, or rather a concept. It's a concept that's been forming in my mind, and it's, I think it's pretty much in front of us, it's very obvious. And actually this concept formed uh, in this industry, because I'm part of this industry, I, I've, I've grown up in this industry. And the, the concept, this idea, is essentially based on the impression that humans and technology are merging. We've always been on that path. And in fact, while we sometimes worry that technology separates us, creates a distance between us, I would argue that technology is bringing us closer together than ever before. And B2H stands for, well, Business to Human stands for B2H. And I want to challenge the concept, or at least take a close look again at B2C and B2B. This is the framework we operate in. We separate these two worlds. But I think it's time that we take another look at how we develop our businesses and which frameworks we apply for that. And, you know, B2B and B2C are arguably still frameworks that date from a time that we used to communicate with our investors, in your case, your investors or our customers, indirectly. It's a one-way voice. We'd figure out whether whatever we were doing with our advertising or message would work, there would be a delay. We'd eventually figure it out, but it wasn't very efficient. But today, everybody is interconnected. Today, we have anybody can have the same kind of relationship with anybody else in the world. We're on the same page. We're directly linked. And that means that, we, that there's now a lot of space uh, to create a world where business become totally personal. Right? You hear the cliche, it's nothing personal, it's business. How can, that can no longer be true because business has become extremely personal now. So I think we may be looking at an era which I call the business to human era, the B2H era. But before I get, I need to explain four megatrends that I think are changing the world as we know it right now. It's not for the future, it's happening as we speak. And I'd like to walk you through those four megatrends, if you'll like me. First one is global connectivity. There's virtual reality, big data, and artificial intelligence. They're all fascinating as much as they are terrifying. But I think we need to learn how to work with them. Let's start with global connectivity. What does global connectivity mean? Okay, global connectivity means that we have just onboarded more than 3 billion people in one place in less than two decades. It's enormous. This is, this is unprecedented that you can mobilize so many people into one place. We've, we've put them online. We're all directly connected with each other. Um, I invite you to stand still at the start for a moment. Three billion people is three times the world population as in the beginning of the 20th century. It's almost the population that when my parents got married in the 60s, that was more or less the world population in those days. All in less than 20 years in one place. Interesting. We think that the internet is something American and maybe also a bit European. But if you, I, I invite you to take a look, actually the internet is Asia. And the future of the internet will be increasingly not America and not Europe. English is not the most spoken language on the internet, arguably. I don't really know. I haven't really done any research into this. But intuitively, there's so many cultures and so many... So the internet is actually different as what we think it is, intuitively. That's interesting, isn't it? And look at the main countries on the internet. Number one is China and India. But definitely the internet is no longer something American, and will, you know, it will decrease to be American. And there's all these other newcomers who are... We spoke about Brazil earlier today. I found that very insightful. I was quite surprised to see that Latin America is so solidly put together from a macroeconomics perspective. But these are... And what we're looking at here is there's going to be another... So if I ask you to meditate on the fact that we put 3 billion people in one place, now think about doubling that in the next five years. That's what we're looking at. That's three to four billion new voices and minds. We're going to come into the fray. It doesn't mean they speak English. There's going to be a whole lot of people speaking uh, Chinese, Indonesian. I don't know. I don't think that's the name of the language. But, uh, but anyway, look at those penetration rates. Um, the subcontinent still has a far way to go. Southeast Asia. Africa. Africa is interesting as well. Three, 
to 4 billion people in five years. If you think it's noisy, it's only begun, my friends. Look at who these people are, the age groups. Um, I would say that if you split that big circle in half, uh, well, that probably puts us somewhere around the 30-year line. So if, if, you, if you work it out, um, one-third of the population is under 30, most likely. That's an interesting fact, but the, the, interesting, the, the first thing I really want you to think about today is what the takeaway is. In this industry, we are all focused on that 7.9% and that 19.7%. Think about this. Why shouldn't we start thinking about how we can bank, literally bank, those 46.2 and 26.1% of the po world population? So, meet your new customer. She cannot imagine a world without technology. She is merged with technology. She will increasingly merge with technology. She will find it totally unacceptable that you don't appear on a screen in front of her. This, and if we go back to that previous slide, there's a lot of those little girls out there. This is your future customer. And when we see these millennials, and we just don't understand, why can't they, why can't they put their phone down? What is wrong with these people? Well, the thing is, that device to them is the best way for them to have personal relationships with other people. It's, for them, it's totally normal to connect with each other through a device. This is the world that they've grown up in, and this is the world that they're going to inherit. So, they come up with things like that we just, Snapchat. Who uses Snapchat? I'm the only person that, okay, someone else uses Snapchat. Makes no sense to us, but for them, it's the way to technically um, sort of mimic a real-time conversation, an ephemeral conversation technology. We cannot really understand their world unless we see it from their perspective, and we really have to do so. Okay, so this generation thinks it's totally normal to make virtual human connections. They find it increasingly difficult to tell the difference between what is in person and what is virtual. And there's a whole lot of them out there, and they're coming. Virtual reality is another very powerful trend which is in full play right now, which will turn our world upside down. Uh, 2016, we'll probably remember as the year that virtual reality became a consumer product. There's more than 25 types of goggles that you can buy to enjoy virtual reality, ranging from the little cardboard box to use it for your Android phone to, you know, very sophisticated material. This man has a foundation, and Bill Clinton's foundation is mostly works in Africa, and it works with education with children. And he's also always looking for money. And he's one of the first people that actually harnessed virtual reality for his cause. Because I'm not going to click on that right now. I don't think we can do that. But if you go on to, there's a, the best way to look for this on Facebook, he has a page there. If you click on that link, you will go to Africa with him and his daughter, and you will be with them in virtual reality if you have the, if you have the equipment uh, to see what they're doing with your money. This is a full immersion experience in how he collects money to get... He, he basically, instead of giving you a PowerPoint presentation, says, like, come with me. Join me to Africa from the comfort of your desk. There's no need to leave anymore. Think about what can you do with this? How can you make a full immersion experience? Something that's extremely tactile even. I'm not going to geek out on virtual reality, because if you let me, I will talk your head off for two hours. But there's a, the only thing I really want to do today is I want to trigger a few questions in your mind. Questions that are not always easy to ask, and the answers are more uncomfortable even. Um, did I just skip? So, business travel. Will we still travel for business in 2025? If we can be someplace and actually have a full immersion? What about office space? Do we need office space in 2025 when we can be somewhere while being somewhere else? Um, these are my favorite question that I like to think about is will we still need all these devices? Because virtual reality means that you virtualize your world. It means that you effectively don't need the phone or the computer anymore because it will somehow appear in your vision of field. 
Um, this is also very disruptive in the sense of that there's a lot of asset value that could be destroyed if these things actually happen. But anyway, these are questions. I don't have the answers, but they're very interesting questions to put on your list of routinary questions to ask. And the question, the last question is, what is your virtual reality strategy? Do you have one? How are you going to earn a place in someone's virtual world? This is another interesting thing to think about. The great thing about the virtual world is that you can edit your own world. It means that you can probably have the ability to leave certain things out of your world. And that means that we have to figure out how we're going to get permission to be part of someone's world. It's a very interesting strategy question here. All right, let's move on. Artificial intelligence. This is by far terrifying and fascinating. Um, you've seen this in the news. Artificial intelligence has three phases of development, and we're, in this, we're crossing the second phase. The third one, you hope never comes, but the second one is where artificial intelligence pretty much is going to start playing on the same field as human. And one of the first, you know, one of the first events that made artificial intelligence cross that line was when Google won the Go game against one of the best Go players. Uh, it's significant because Go is a very complex game. I don't want to get into much detail, but the one that I find most fascinating and is probably more um, illustrative of what we're going to be going through in the next few years is that there's a robot surgeon that operated on a pig. It opened up the pig, it um, fixed the intestines, closed up the pig, the pig's fine. It usually takes the surgeon years and years of study and then practice to, comp to successfully do this kind of an operation. Now done entirely autonomously by a robot, no human intervention. Think about the knowledge work that you have been training for or the people that are desperate to get their MBA. There's a robot that can you know, make do a total operation. Now we did it on a pig, I guess, because it's the closest thing to a human, biologically speaking, right? But it makes you think about what's going to happen with knowledge work. And McKinsey has been thinking about this for a few years. This is back in, I think this was from 2013. Yes, I think it. And McKinsey has this really awesome report that you should really have a look at because uh, they are seeing that uh, knowledge work will probably be entirely replaced by 2025. I, for the lawyers in the room, I forget the name, but there is an American law firm who now has a, an, an AI lawyer uh, who's actually doing all the groundwork. Right? Uh, it's important for portfolio management. Anything that has a process, anything that has to do with research and tying knowledge together into something and useful is going to be handed over to AI eventually. Um, and it is already, so it is already disrupting the knowledge jobs. But there's one thing that AI really is terrible at and is very far away from mastering, and that's the human emotional connection. Um, there's a lot of attempts to do it. I, I don't know, you get these robot calls in the UK. I don't know if you have this in Luxembourg, but in the UK they have these robots calling you. They're trying to fool you that they're, uh, that they're actually a human, but you know, you do a quick, dirty version Turing test and you figure out that it's really a robot. Uh, or, you know, you have these touch tones on the other side of companies. So, uh, we're missing an opportunity here because AI, whatever it's going to become, is going to struggle with a human emotional connection. And uh, that's actually good news. But somehow, a lot of businesses are trying to do this. This robo-finance uh, is on the wrong track, I think, because what robo-finance is awesome, but why would you want to try to create a special relationship with your customer by putting a robot in front of him. Use the AI, use the technology to improve your human relationship. We're going to get into that a little bit more, but I think fundamentally a lot of businesses are making a fundamental, they're taking the wrong, uh, there's, there's, um, there's a fork in the road and I think they're taking the wrong road. I wrote a free special report about this. If you're interested in getting that, it's on my site. Uh, it's a little, it's sort of like a little ebook. Um, I'm always adding to it, so by all means, uh, and I title it Artificial Intelligence Wants Your Job. So I, I really recommend that you take a look at it. Maybe it will give you some things to think about, or maybe lose sleep over. Big data is uh, very important. This is probably the most commonly mentioned uh, of the four themes. Uh, and who, you know this man, Eric Schmidt? Uh, he runs Alphabet. He used to run, Alphabet is what the old Google was. And he, 
He said the internet will disappear. Now, don't worry, the internet is not going to shut down. What he means with this is that the internet will become omnipresent. It will be very difficult. Right now, we can still hear, I'm going to go online, I'm going to go offline. I'm going to go online. In the future, you're going to be online. Everything's going to be online because this is going to be online. Every device is going to be online. It's going to be trillions of online devices. So what he said that the internet will disappear, he means that technology will become invisible. And that's when, that's when the merger of humans and technology is, is going to come into its acceleration. But what I like about big data is, um, you know, you have all this business, they get into this meeting room, they close the door and they start brainstorming. Why would you brainstorm when you don't have to guess anymore? The data is out there. It's more like an exercise of finding the data and doing something with it. So the new definition of intelligence is no longer what you know, but it's all about your ability to collect data because the data is out there. What I mentioned previously, all those trillions of devices, there's going to be data on everything. And so it, it's going to redefine what we understand as intelligence. I find that quite interesting. And it's all about having that competitive advantage. It's that, it's like in, it's that, uh, you know, I, we spoke about high frequency trading, split second kind of thing. Well, I, I think in this, in, with data, we're going there as well. So you have to think, one of the questions you have to ask is, can you get a competitive advantage by figuring out how to interpret your data instead of trying to figure out building an avatar in your head of your customer? Actually, you know, the data is there. You can, you, you sort of almost know what they're thinking. And I need to give a moment. So, if you, if you do this right, um, you can you can run, small companies can run circles around large corporations. It redefines power. Okay. So, um, question is, do you have the skills in house to deal with these four mega trends? Is there, are these questions that you're asking yourself? Are you trying to find answers? Are you are you trying to turn this into that competitive advantage? And maybe wondering, so why am I speaking about all this? Well, I think we're looking at an amazing set of opportunities. Um, because those who will be able to make real human connections in a virtual world will win. And there's a short window to get really ahead on this. Because if you can make a human connection in a world that is overwhelming, three to four billion new voices, very loud, it's a, if you can make your human connection in the virtual world, that's what's going to matter. It's going to require a whole set of new skills. Okay? You're going to have to create, uh, uh, you know, you have to rethink your human resources department. You're going to have to rethink your career, maybe. Because this is my own chart. I didn't pull that from anywhere. It feels intuitively right to me. But I think that anything that is not in that box, you may sort of want to reconsider your career if you're, if you're not in that box. And if you're in the northwest, uh, northeast corner of that box, um, absolutely, you know, keep going. Because it's all about, I think, the human element is going to be what really is going to make that big difference. It's like the alpha in your business where all the rest becomes beta to build on what you were just saying. So it's all about creating amazing customer experiences. So we have all these tools with the virtual reality, which means that I can do my customer meeting in the Taj Mahal. I can, we, or we can set up a meeting at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Why not? We're going to go there in the future. I, I, know, I know I'm totally geeking out now, but the, the point is that we're going to be able to create amazing experiences with technology. With, with that new generation, to them it feels totally natural that we're doing this. We're going to be using artificial intelligence to be able to answer their questions. It's, kind of, it's quite pleasant. If you would you take your phone out and say, or your virtual reality device, say, I have a question I'm going to talk to. And then this person appears, and then suddenly they have all the answers for you in a human fashion, human to human. Interesting. That could be very pleasant. Because uh, AI will give us knowledge. It will come naturally. Knowledge will be a commodity. But it's that um, social skills, the emotional intelligence, will become the true skill of the future. Um, I always show this, I want to stop on this graph for a second because I always show this graph because the big takeaway here is, I think, is, you know, we all have a mentor in our life or mentors. We never forget these people. We won't cheat on them. They will always hold a special place in our hearts and in our minds. The goal is five, six billion people out there. Most of them are beginners. Become their mentor. 
You have an opportunity to, if you're, in, if you're in the investment industry, you can teach these people how to invest. And I know there's a bunch of regulations and all that that are fencing these, these markets away from each other and all that. I know that, but you know, there were a lot of people who were totally against cars and airplanes. But the, the main, the, the, the force of um, that drive to learn how to invest is going to be far superior than any regulation. So if you can occupy a space where you can become their mentor, uh, you can build a customer for life. This, the way this graph works, I call it like when, it, when a prospect moves from the prospect zone to the client zone, it's because there's a compounded effect of sharing knowledge, building your relationship and gaining trust. So if you can somehow use all this technology, build, and this is what I specialize in, build systems that can allow you to supply this kind of knowledge that builds trust over time, uh, then your business development becomes mighty scalable on a global basis. I hope that makes sense. So I'm saying it again. This is the new race. It's making human connections in a, in a, in a virtual world. Don't worry about the technology. Technology is, is intelligent. It's going to take care of itself figure out how you can make those connections. I also think, personally, that it's the biggest employment opportunity ever because there's one thing that we were all naturally trained for and that's to deal with other humans. It's not like you have to go get an MBA to go be a good human communicator because we just use ourselves, our, we're built like this. So, thinking when you have 200 and, was it 280 million people in Indonesia, they have their own culture and their own language, uh, those human interfaces is gonna be the biggest employment opportunity. And it's not going to be like those sweaty call centers with crackling phone lines. It's actually going to be a privileged job where you actually have the ability to make a human connection and turn that into something monetizable. So it's, it, it's, this is going to employ billions of people in the world. Right? There's even businesses out there who are trying to figure out how they can crowdsource client services to their own customers and give their customers an incentive. This kind of stuff is happening. And it's happening in the country next door, Belgium. Um, I want to finish on, so I've just sort of scratched the surface of this idea. Um, if you want to know more about this, I have a, a free ebook that I just published about it. Uh, so if you go to my site and feel free to get that. Uh, it's all yours. So all my information is on there. Uh, my insights, I share them openly. It's all, uh, it's all for free. I, I want you to have it because I think it's important. Thank you very much.